Subaru was one of the first companies to enter the smallest crossover category in the United States, the one that encompasses things like the Mazda CX-3, the Honda HRV, and of course, the Subaru Crosstrek. You'll notice that for 2016, the Crosstrek has lost the confusing XV in front of its name. It used to be known as the XV Crosstrek. Although it was a little bit confusing to Americans, the XV prefix had a pedigree because this is known as the Impreza XV in Japan. The Impreza XV, XV Crosstrek, or Subaru Crosstrek, whatever you want to call it, is one of Subaru's off-road wagon-styled vehicles. This is very similar to what we see in the Subaru Outback. The Outback is basically a Subaru legacy that's been turned into a more cargo-friendly off-road vehicle. That's exactly what's going on here. They took the Subaru Impreza sedan and they turned it into a more cargo-friendly off-road vehicle. For 2016, the front end of the Crosstrek got a few tweaks to bring this more in line with the rest of the Subaru lineup. We have a slightly different grille up front. We still have rugged bits down below because the Crosstrek is designed to go off-road. But the style of off-roading that the Crosstrek is designed for is just a little bit different than what we see over at Jeep. The Subaru does have an incredible 8.7 inches of ground clearance, making it one of the highest off the ground in this particular segment. But we don't have a locking center coupling. We don't have a two-speed transfer case like you do find in something like a Jeep Cherokee. I realize the Jeep Cherokee is a little bit bigger than this, but it highlights sort of the different off-road mission that we see in Subaru and Jeep. This is the kind of vehicle that really is targeted at my demographic specifically. I live a mile down a gravel road. You never know when there might be a tree down in the road, when it's raining, when there might be a rut in the road, etc. This is the kind of vehicle that will handle that situation obviously much better than your average front wheel drive sedan or hatchback, but also better than your average crossover in this segment because of the ground clearance. It means you're less likely to hit things underneath the vehicle. Like the Subaru Outback, when you take a look at the side profile of the Crosstrek, it's obvious that Subaru is marching to a slightly different drummer in this segment because this is a very station wagon -y, very hatchback-like form, even though we have the ground clearance that we find in upper-end Jeep models. Because Subaru did not try and redesign the Impreza's body to make it look more like a boxy crossover like we see in the Chevy Trax or the Honda HRV, the length of this vehicle ends up being a little bit different than its competition, and that does confuse a few people. This is 175.2 inches long. That means this is six inches shorter than a Toyota RAV4. It's also about six inches longer than a Honda HRV. Therefore, some people want to try and put this vehicle into the category where the RAV4 plays, but that's not this vehicle's mission. The RAV4's competitor in the Subaru lineup really is the Subaru Forester. This competes with the CX-3, the Chevy Trax, the Honda HRV, and the Nissan Juke. Thanks to some subtle changes versus the regular Impreza hatchback, this definitely looks like a crossover. We have large tail lamps back here. We have some rugged treatment down here at the bottom of the rear bumper. Black sections right over here around these reflectors. I'm really not sure what this little square is right here in the middle of the rear bumper. I suspect that's for other world markets. For the US market, there is just one engine under the hood. It is a two liter, four cylinder boxer style engine. A boxer style engine means that these cylinders are not all in a neat little row like you see in every other vehicle in this segment. These are in two banks of two and the cylinders are actually horizontally posed. So they're going at each other right like that. That's kind of why they call it a boxer engine because it looks like fists boxing. This engine produces 148 horsepower and 145 pound-feet of torque in its base trim. And there are two transmissions available, a five-speed manual transmission or a CVT or continuously variable transmission. There's also a hybrid model of the Crosstrek that adds an electric motor and brings the system total up to 160 horsepower and 163 pound-feet of torque. One of the big things to remember about this vehicle when you're comparing it to the competition is that all Crosstrek models come standard with all-wheel drive. In fact, all Subaru models sold in North America with only one exception come standard with all-wheel drive. So when you're taking a look at the fuel economy numbers, if these numbers look a little bit lower than the advertised numbers you see in the competition, keep in mind you have to take a look at the competition with all-wheel drive to really have a true comparison. Fuel economy starts out at 26 miles per gallon if you get the manual transmission. It jumps a considerable amount up to 29 miles per gallon if you get the CVT. If you get the hybrid model, it gets 31 miles per gallon. You'll notice there's not really that much of a difference between the regular CVT and the hybrid model that also uses a traditional CVT. If you're looking for a crossover with a very car-like seating position, and that would be a little bit lower in the vehicle, legs a little bit further out, not sitting quite as upright, then the Crosstrek is definitely the vehicle for you. It's all because of the vehicle's shape. The box in this vehicle is just not quite as tall as we see in some of the competition. That means that we're not sitting quite as upright. Some people seem to prefer this, 
some people seem to prefer a more upright seating position. In terms of overall seat comfort, this is fairly average in this segment. I'm going to give this 8 out of 10 points, very similar to what we see in the major competition in this segment. There's no power seat available. All we get is a six-weight manual driver's seat that's adjustable for height, slides forward and backward, and reclines. We also have no two-way adjustable lumbar support. The tilt telescopic steering column has a moderate range of motion, making it fairly easy for shorter or taller drivers to find a good driving position. Moving to the rear seats, we see the same thing as we saw up front. The seating position is a little bit more reclined. Things are a little bit more compact than we see in the competition. We have about two inches more legroom in something like an HRV, a little bit more headroom in that HRV as well. Versus something like a Subaru Forester, this is about two inches of legroom less and two inches of headroom less. The Subaru Forester has a very, very upright profile, that extremely tall boxy profile to it that really improves headroom. So if you have people, especially in the back seat frequently, that need more headroom, you'll definitely find the Forester more accommodating. If you find yourself sitting in the middle of the Crosstrex rear bench seat, you'll notice a few things right away. First thing is, I have about half an inch of headroom. That's definitely more than you find in the middle seat in a wide variety of the competition. The other thing you'll notice is that this rear bench seat is definitely wider than your average subcompact crossover. I comment on vehicle profiles frequently because it really does affect the practicality of a vehicle. The Honda HRV is six inches shorter than this, but we actually find a larger cargo area because of the way the Honda HRV is shaped. Still, at just over 22 cubic feet, this is one of the larger cargo areas in this category, and it's significantly larger than what we see in something like the Mazda CX-3. The CX-3's cargo area is really quite small. This cargo area is more than capable of handling these 24-inch roller bags in this position. Definitely have room between that and the cargo hatch. We can also put them in this more upright position, and they will still fit below this roller shade cover. If you aren't planning on using the cargo cover, the bags will still fit in this very upright position. You can easily put approximately four across the rear and still close the hatchback. You can also put some additional hand luggage right across the back. Also a little different from the competition is that we still find a compact spare tire under the cargo area load floor. Thanks to the generously sized cargo area and that spare tire under the cargo area load floor, this trunk gets nine out of 10 points in our exclusive trunk comfort index. As we take a look around the interior, keep in mind we are in the top end trim, so we do have a sunroof. We also have four-way adjustable headrests, these ratchet forward and backward, and they also go up and down. We have height adjustable seat belts for both the driver and the front passenger, and our model has the optional leather upholstery. The majority of the Crosstrex interior is shared with the Impreza, and that means we get parts quality that's a little bit higher than some of the competition. We see soft touch upper portions to the door here, a soft touch insert right there above the armrest, and a soft touch armrest. Storage cubby right down there towards the bottom of the door. We see the same thing when we move over to the dashboard. The upper portion is a soft touch injection molded part. We have black trim with sort of an imitation metallic trim right there, and a very generously sized bin style glove compartment. It's easily able to put an iPad inside. In the center of the dashboard above the air vents, we find our trip computer, our temperature readout, and our clock. Interestingly enough, this trip computer is controlled via a button right here in the instrument cluster. So we push this in, you can see elapsed time, average miles per hour, distance to empty, average miles per gallon, etc. Below the trip computer, we find two air vents, the hazard light button, and our model has the optional infotainment and navigation system that's essentially shared with the Subaru Forester and other Subaru models. It's a touchscreen unit. We have touch buttons over here on the side, home, map, apps, info, track forward, backward, etc. The system offers the ability to integrate with Subaru's Starlink app, AHA, Pandora, and of course it supports MirrorLink if you have a phone that supports that. This does not support Android Auto or Apple CarPlay at this time. If you want to know more about this infotainment system, go ahead and click that banner at the bottom of your screen. You'll be taken on over to our complete review on this system in a different Subaru model. Below the infotainment system, we have a single zone automatic climate control in our model. We have a storage cubby right below that. It's fairly deep and it has a 12 volt power outlet at the back. We have a very traditional console shifter, drive us all the way to the back. Then we have manual mode over to the left, but you don't push this up or down or wiggle it side to side for the manual mode. Instead, we have paddles on the back of the steering wheel. Between the front seats, we find a traditional handbrake, a storage cubby right here where you can put your key. This is what the new Subaru key looks like. You can also very easily put parking passes, business cards, that sort of thing right in that little slot. Two very large cup holders right here. The divider is not removable. And you'll find the controls for the heated seats right over here on the driver's side. We have a softly padded center armrest that opens to reveal a moderately sized storage cubby. Keep in mind there is a transmission in portions of the drivetrain under the center console. This is not as deep as you find in some. However, you can still put phones, wallets, that sort of thing very easily inside. The instrument cluster is very similar to what we see in other Subaru models. We have a tachometer on the left, 
speedometer on the right, and then a fuel economy gauge right below that. It shows us sort of how we're doing in our average, whether we're increasing it or whether we're decreasing it. And then in the center, we have a multifunction color display. But this display has a little bit less information going on than you'll find in some of the competition, because remember, the trip computer is actually in the center of the dashboard. It's not in this multifunction display. This display will indicate what gear your transmission is in, whether we're in drive, whether we're in the manual mode, what gear we're selecting with those paddle shifters, etc. We also have a digital speedometer up top and a digital fuel gauge. If you decide to buy the optional camera-based adaptive cruise control system, then this would show your set speed as well as the follow distance between you and the car in front of you. The steering wheel is a modified three-spoke design with small spork grips right up top and again paddle shifters on the back of the wheel. We have down on the left and up on the right. The left side of the steering wheel is where you'll find volume up, down, track forward, backward, a mute button, and the ability to control that infotainment system in the center of the instrument cluster. We also have our source selection, voice command button, dedicated phone hang up and pick up button. If I turn the wheel, you'll notice we have an additional three buttons right here below the phone hang up and pick up button. That allows you to change some of the options right there in the center of the instrument cluster. On the right side of the steering wheel, we find the controls for the cruise control or the optional adaptive cruise control. This changes your following distance right here, resume, set, and then cruise control enable disable. Thanks to a decent amount of low end power and throttle mapping that is quite aggressive, acceleration feels a little bit quicker than it actually is in the Crosstrek. Zero to 60 times came in at 9.5 seconds, which actually ties this with the Honda HRV as one of the slower entries in this segment. Thanks to the CVT, this doesn't feel quite as sluggish as something like a Chevy Trax. The Chevy Trax is not only one of the slower vehicles in this segment, but it also feels more sluggish. If I were to floor this vehicle, the acceleration that we get out of the Crosstrek is a little bit more instant than we see over there in the Chevy Subcompact Small Crossover. When it comes to braking, it took 126 feet for this vehicle to stop from 60 to 0, which means this is about 5 to 6 feet longer than something like the CX-3, the Trax, or the HRV. However, this did stop a little bit shorter than something like the Jeep Renegade in our most recent tests. When it comes to handling the different priorities that we see in this Subaru versus some of the other entries in this segment are obvious. We get a little bit more body roll, a little bit more tip and dive in this vehicle. That's because this suspension is tuned a little bit softer, a little bit more compliant, and a little bit more geared for rough road use. When you take a look at something like a Mazda CX-3, it handles incredibly well, but it's really not that comfortable to drive out on a grooved road or a bumpy road or a really gnarly gravel road. It's just a little bit too stiff for that kind of activity. The same thing goes for the Nissan Juke. You may think this is somewhat similar to the Jeep Renegade, but they're actually quite different because the Renegade is trying to be a rock climbing kind of subcompact crossover. And as such, the vehicle ends up being an awful lot heavier than the Crosstrek, and it definitely feels like it out on the road. We get even more body roll, even more tip and dive, and of course the absolute grip numbers are just not as good in that Renegade. As I said earlier, the Crosstrek really seems to be designed for my demographic exactly. Again, I live down a gravel road, the one that we're on right here, and the gravel road can get rough and gnarly at certain times of the year. It can, of course, get muddy in the winter, etc. So the permanent all-wheel drive, the relatively supple suspension, and the high ground clearance definitely are things that I look for when it comes time to buying a new vehicle. Because of the design of this all-wheel drive system, this always feels very sure-footed regardless of the surface that you're on, snow, mud, ice, gravel, etc. Thanks to the relatively supple suspension, the ride is also among the best in the segment. This is definitely not trying to go for a hardcore, punishing, sporty ride, etc. This is definitely trying to soak up bumps and ruts on roads like we're driving on right here. Back out on the asphalt, the softer suspension still pays dividends. This gives you one of the best highway rides in this segment. The ride is easily going to get an A-plus score. Cabin noise, on the other hand, is going to get a C, because this is one of the louder cabins even in this subcompact segment. We get more road noise, a decent amount more wind noise, and quite a bit more engine noise, especially when accelerating in this vehicle versus most of the competition. The trade-off, of course, is fuel economy because we have been averaging a surprising 30 miles per gallon in mixed driving in this vehicle. That's a hair above what the EPA says you're going to get, and keep in mind, I do go up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass every day. Fuel economy has definitely been a high priority for Subaru with their latest engine and transmission designs. And keep in mind, this vehicle is a full-time all-wheel drive system. Although this system does not try and send 60% of the power to the rear or 50% of the power to the rear all the time like we have seen in previous Subaru models, it is far more aggressive about locking up its center coupling than any other entry in this segment. And as a result, we don't get that vague hint of torque steer and then an engagement of the all-wheel drive system like you do see in most of the entries in this segment. This system is generally trying to send some power to the rear axle, although in this latest generation of Subaru's all-wheel drive system, it's trying to keep most of it right up front. 
Although obviously fuel economy is important, Subaru could easily have gotten better fuel economy by designing the system to send power only to the front axle until it was absolutely needed out back. However, it wouldn't really be a Subaru if they did that. Subarus are definitely known for excellent snow traction, excellent wet weather traction, excellent gravel traction, etc. And the reason for that is that this system is always sending some power to the rear axle. It doesn't have to wait for slip to occur before it can shift power around. Assuming that there is wheel slip, this vehicle can lock the center coupling and send 50% of the power to the front, 50% of the power to the rear. This is not going to be as rock crawling capable as some of the systems that we find in the Jeep lineup, but that's not really the mission of Subaru. As I said before, the real competition to the Crosstrek is the subcompact crossover segment, not the compact crossover segment. And when you start comparing this to the other vehicles in the subcompact crossover segment, you'll really notice that the Crosstrek feels a little bit more grown up, a little bit more refined out on the road and in the cabin, with the exception of that cabin noise score. This is again a little bit louder. Aside from that, however, the Crosstrek just feels a little bit more refined behind the wheel. One of the other things that we see in this model that we don't see in the competition is that we have a lane departure warning system, we have this adaptive cruise control system, and the autonomous braking system provided by EyeSight right up here above the rearview mirror. This is a twin camera system. It uses two cameras, one on the passenger side, one on the driver's side, and it's constantly looking at the road in front. The stereo camera system gives this vehicle depth perception. That's exactly how humans can tell how far an object is in front of us. Same thing is going on for the car. And it uses that not just for the safety systems, but also again to give us the adaptive cruise control that we find in this vehicle. It is a full speed range adaptive cruise control system. It will take you to a complete stop. That is something that we don't see in very many vehicles out there. More and more vehicles are getting adaptive cruise control systems, but a lot of them will stop around 15 or 20 miles an hour. They won't help you in stop and go traffic, and this system will. Subaru tells us that there are two main benefits to the EyeSight system. It's not going to get damaged in a minor collision, because if you have a radar sensor in your front bumper, you're in a minor fender bender, the radar sensor is going to get damaged. The other thing they tell us is that the system is less expensive because cameras are just less expensive than radar sensors. On the downside, however, this system doesn't seem to operate quite as well in inclement weather as the radar-based systems. So if you can't see out of the windscreen in your vehicle, the EyeSight cameras, they can't see out of the car either. Before we dive right into pricing, let me apologize for sounding a little on the nasally side. I've had a bad cold, but the show must go on. The Crosstrek comes in a few different trims. Things start out with the 2.0i trim, thing to know about that one is that that is a manual transmission trim only. If you want to get the automatic transmission, you have to step up to the premium trim. Now the 2.0i does come very well configured in this segment because as I've said all along, all Subaru models come standard with all-wheel drive. That base trim also gives you the backup camera and USB and Bluetooth integration. Now stepping up to the $22,395 premium trim does not make the automatic transmission standard. So if you do want the manual transmission and heated seats and a cargo cover, you can get the premium so equipped. However, if you want the limited trim, which gives you the leather upholstery, the larger infotainment system, etc., then you do have to get the CVT because it comes standard in that model. The limited trim is also the version that you'll find things like automatic climate control in, blind spot monitoring, cross traffic detection, and the optional EyeSight safety system that combines adaptive cruise control as well as collision warning and collision braking. Next up, we have the two hybrid trims. The hybrid starts at $26,395, and it's the only hybrid in this particular category because, again, the RAV4 hybrid is a next size step up. It really is a Subaru Forester-sized vehicle. In addition to the all-wheel drive hybrid system being standard, we also get LED tail lamps and the 6.2-inch infotainment system. You can sort of correlate the hybrid trim to the premium trim in the regular Crosstrek lineup. Then we have the hybrid Touring, which gives us leather seats, the 7-inch navigation system, as well as keyless go, keyless entry, and the power moonroof. When comparing the Crosstrek with the competition, there are a few things you need to keep in mind. First off, this is a little bit larger and a little bit more roomy on the inside because it's based on the Subaru Impreza. The Subaru Impreza is more of a Honda Civic-sized vehicle, not a Honda Fit-sized vehicle. And Honda's HRV is based off of the Honda Fit. The Mazda CX-3, even though it has a 3 in the name, is not based off the Mazda 3, it's actually based off the Mazda 2. So most entries in this segment are going to be a little bit smaller on the outside and actually a little bit smaller on the inside in terms of passenger dimensions. The cargo area in some of them may be a little bit larger, but especially when it comes to seat width, the Crosstrek is going to compare very well. The other thing to keep in mind, of course, is that all-wheel drive is standard, even if you get the manual transmission. And that's not what we see in the rest of the competition in this segment. 
When you take a look at the chart on this side of your screen, it's really obvious what standard all-wheel drive does to the pricing setup here. $21,595 is where the Crosstrek starts. It's also where the all-wheel drive Crosstrek starts because, again, it is standard. That means that if you just want a vehicle in this segment with all-wheel drive, this is going to be one of the least expensive. You'll also notice over here that the Jeep Renegade is listed twice. There's a reason for that. The base Renegade model is very, very basic. If you want all-wheel drive, you can get it in that base model, and you can get it without air conditioning, without power mirrors, etc. That would be that $19,995 price. If, however, you want an automatic transmission or if you want air conditioning or some of those other features that you do find in every other entry in this segment, then it's going to cost you that $23,395 to $23,515 range. Of course, most shoppers in this segment are looking for a vehicle with an automatic transmission. That's what that last column on this chart is showing us, the combination of automatic transmission plus all-wheel drive. When you take a look at this column, you'll notice that the Impreza is actually a little bit more expensive than most of the competition, except for that Fiat 500X down there at the bottom. Because there are just six competitors in this segment, let's try and cover them all, so we'll do this relatively quickly. The Fiat 500X is attractive in my mind. It's positioned more as a mini competitor, however, than a competitor to the other entries in this particular segment. It has a nicer interior than the Crosstrek, and I think a nicer interior than most entries in this segment. However, it can get more expensive than most other entries in this segment, including the Crosstrek, depending on how you configure it. Reliability has been a little bit of an issue for the Fiat since it was launched in the United States, and it's a little bit less off-road capable than the Subaru. However, I think the 500X is a very good entry for someone in this segment that wants a stylish vehicle, something that's more of a mini alternative, as I said earlier. Of course, the Fiat Chrysler conglomerate has two entries in this segment, that 500X and the closely related Jeep Renegade. The Jeep Renegade is really the truer competitor in this particular segment, and it's aimed squarely at every other small crossover that we're seeing here. The Renegade's all-wheel drive system is easily the most robust in this segment. It was originally designed for the larger Jeep Cherokee, and it features a locking center coupling, the ability to change the way the all-wheel drive system behaves, etc. Now, it lacks the two-speed transfer case that we see in the Jeep Cherokee, but it shares with it the rugged all-wheel drive system design. In addition, the Renegade, I think, is one of the more attractive entries in this segment. It also has a very large cargo area. There are a few downsides to the Renegade, however. The base trims are quite basic, as I said earlier. It also is one of the slowest vehicles 0 to 60 in this segment. And that doesn't matter whether you get the 1.4 liter turbocharged engine or the up-level 2.4 liter engine. In addition, the top end trims of the Renegade, especially the luxury trims or the off-road Trailhawk trim, can get quite expensive compared to the rest of the competition. Next up, we have the Chevy Trax, which is my least favorite entry in this particular segment. It does have a low base price, it does have a reasonably efficient engine, and it does have a fold-flat front seat. However, the interior is definitely a little dowdy compared to the rest of the competition. The real trouble for the Trax, however, is that the Buick Encore exists, and that all around, the Buick Encore is a better buy, whether we're talking about the 2016 Buick Encore or the recently refreshed 2017 Buick Encore. If you like the general look of the tracks, trust me, you'll like the Buick Encore an awful lot more. It's only going to be about four to $5,000 more expensive, depending on exactly how you've configured your model. But for that extra cash, the Encore gets a considerably nicer and more comfortable interior. The Nissan Juke is one of the best handling entries in this segment, although it is one of the most polarizing looking in terms of its general appearance. It also is one of the faster entries in this segment thanks to the combination of a turbocharged engine and the continuously variable transmission. Some people may see the styling as a positive, some people may definitely see the styling of the Juke as a negative. The interior is also getting a little bit old because it is one of the older entries in this segment. The interior is also one of the smallest in this segment, so if you take a look at the back seat and especially the cargo area, you're going to find less room in the back and less room in the cargo area than almost every other entry in this segment. Like the Nissan Juke, the Mazda CX-3 has one of the smaller rear passenger areas and one of the smaller cargo compartments in this segment. On the flip side, however, the CX-3 gives us one of the highest levels of standard equipment that we see in this particular segment. It also has one of the freshest and best looking interiors. The CX-3 starts at $19,960, that's about $1,500 less than the Subaru, and it includes a standard automatic transmission. The automatic transmission is optional in the Subaru. That means that the CX-3 is going to be several thousand dollars less than a comparably equipped Crosstrek. The CX-3 is also one of the best handling vehicles in this segment. On the downside, it's not one of the fastest entries in this segment, and again, the rear passenger compartment and rear cargo area are a little bit cramped. 
Lastly, we have the Honda HRV, which I think is a really tough competitor for the Subaru. The HRV is practical, it has a relatively low price, including the all wheel drive model with the automatic transmission. It has a high level of standard feature content and high fuel economy. It also has a very accommodating rear cargo area and rear passenger area. The HRV is not as fast and not as capable as the Subaru, but it is one of the few vehicles in this segment that really can compete with the Crosstrek in terms of interior refinement. The HRV is quiet, the interior is well put together for a vehicle in this segment. If my money were on the line, I would probably buy the Mazda CX-3. It would be a really close call, but the CX-3 edges out the others in this segment because of its handling ability, because of the high level of feature content, and I really like the way the CX-3 looks. The CX-3 is not as fast as some of the others, but I think the handling really does compensate in my mind. If, however, you're looking for a more family-friendly vehicle, something with more cargo room, more rear passenger room, some of those more advanced safety features, the Crosstrek is definitely an excellent buy. And in that next segment, I would actually say that the HRV and the Crosstrek tie with one another for that number two pick in this segment for me. Or actually a number one pick, again, if you value that cargo area or the rear seat accommodation. I think the HRV is a slightly better value in this segment than the Crosstrek. It's targeted at someone that wants a mini-me sized Honda CRV. I think the Crosstrek really is targeted at someone that wants a mini-me sized Subaru Outback. That correlation really works because the Crosstrek is more off-road capable, more sure-footed in wet weather than we see in the HRV, but the HRV is a little bit more traditionally SUV styled. The Crosstrek is also going to be slightly more accommodating for families in the rear passenger area because of that slightly wider rear seat. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes, and this has been the 2016 Subaru Crosstrek. Be sure and hit that subscribe button down there. You can also find me over at facebook.com slash alexnautos, and I'll see you next week.